Uh, good morning or good afternoon, where, um, everyone. Welcome to the ICBS uh, Fourth Digital Forum. And it's really my great honor to co-host this digital forum with my colleagues, um, and Dr. Angie Atkin from uh, South <laughs> Africa. And uh, as first, I will um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Zinita Nikolska and uh, Kolaska. Sorry, Zinita. Uh, yeah, and. Basically, uh, Zinita is the president of uh, International uh, Chemical Biology Society, and he is she is also a professor and uh, at the University of Michigan. And uh, Zinita will deliver some welcome notes. Um, please go ahead, Zinita. Thank you, Shuibing. As Shuibing said, it good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world and joining us today. My name is Janetta nikolovska Koleska. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. As the president of the International Chemical Biology Society, I would like to welcome you to the first ICBS Digital Forum on Chemical Biology in Stem Cells from Basic Tools to Translational Application. First, I would like to thank Drs. Chen and Atkins for organizing this very exciting event and Drs. Clevers, Ding, and Wagner for accepting our invitation to participate on this first digital forum. I also would like to thank Whale Cornell Medicine for supporting this event. Before starting, I would like briefly to introduce the ICBS, which is independent nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting research and educational opportunities at the interface of chemistry and biology. In the last 10 years, the ICBS provides an important international forum and serve as an intellectual home for cross-disciplinary scientists from academia, nonprofit organization, industry, and government. During the past several years, ICBS has made major initiatives to implement programs in order to enhance members' experience and facilitate professional network and global partnership to enrich career development, introduce ICBS recognition programs and awards. And I would like to highlight the ICBS Young Chemical Biologist Award, the ICBS Global Lectureship, Travel and Presentation Awards. In particular, we are very much focused on training the next generation of chemical biologists and leaders. And in the couple of last years, an increasing number of ICBS students, young scholars chapters have been established around the world, including in North America, Europe, Asia, Australia. These chapters are led by Dr. Bridget Wagner, and they organize multiple events, including symposia, cross chapter meetings, career panels, trainee awards, with the overall goal to enrich the training and professional career development of future chemical biologists. I will use this opportunity and announce our very exciting next event, uh, which will happen in uh, September 2022, West Coast Regional One Day Symposium. The symposium will be organized in collaboration with Merck Auditorium, and the topic of this symposium will be industry and academia collaboration events in chemical biology. Please stay tuned, more information will follow up. The annual ICBS conference is a key event where scientists uh, meet to share ideas, exchange knowledge and advance the field of chemical biology. The last year ICBS virtual annual conference commemorated the 10th anniversary of our society. So with this, I would like to invite you to join us for our 11th annual conference this December, which will happen in Brisbane, Australia. We look forward to meeting you in Brisbane. I will conclude my introduction by inviting you to join ICBS if you are not a member yet and become eligible for the many membership benefits to be connected with the global chemical biology community and to contribute to the ICBS activities that shape the future of the chemical biology. With this, I will turn to Dr. Shen to introduce our first speaker. 
Thank you. Thank you Zina, for a very, very nice introduction about ICDS and deliver the welcome notes. And uh, now it's, uh, we, today we have the honor to invite three speakers and uh, just brief introduction about the format. If you have any questions, please type your question in the Q&A session and the speaker will answer the question at the end. And it's really my great honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Hans Cleaver. I don't think Hans really need any introduction, uh, but just very briefly, Hans obtained his uh, MD degree in 1984 and his PhD uh, from the University of um, Yorkshire and Netherlands. And his postdoc work was done at Dan Harbor University, uh, at Harvard University. Um, and Hans uh, was a professor in immunology at University of UK. And since 2002, uh, he's a professor of molecular genetics. And then since he was also the director um, of the um, Hodges Institute in the um, UK. And from um, 2012 to 2015, he was the president of Royal Netherlands Academy of Art and Science. And from um, 2015 to 2019, he was a director of research of the Princess Max Center of Pediatric and Oncology. And at the beginning of this year, and has um, moved to um, Switzerland, and he is currently the lead of farm research and early development and a member of the large cooperative executive committee of uh, F. Hoffman La Roche in um, Basel, Switzerland. Hans, welcome. Thank you very much, Xu Bing. I'll uh, try to share my screen. That works. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So what I'll try to do in the next half hour is uh, give some background as to uh, how my lab uh, 12, 14 years ago uh, found the stem cells of this particular organ, the small intestinal epithelium. Uh, and then the, from these stem cells uh, developed uh, adult stem cell based organoid technology. And I'll give a number of examples of recent examples how we have used uh, organoids. So here you see the villi, the protrusions that help us digest food very efficiently. These cells are exposed to a very harsh biological environment and are constantly being replenished from these structures called the crypts of Lipacoon. And uh, we found uh, Nick Barker actually uh, about 15 years ago that at the very base of the crypts, there are these multicolor cells, um, clearly done by the animator here, but they are LGR5 positive and, and Nick showed that they are the stem cells that drive this incredible, uh, incredibly active cell renewal process. Uh, in a mouse, the intestinal epithelium turns over every five days. So in a human being, if that would go with the same speed, we would produce something like 100 grams of cells every day on the inner lining of our gut. Uh, from the stem cells at the base of the crypt. Now, um, this is what the mice look like that Nick used. So they were algae-fine mock-in mice. Here you see three villi, about five crypts. Uh, GFP was knocked into the LDR5 locus, so we basically visualized the stem cells. You can see them here. We also had another CRE-R knocked in. This allowed us to show that they actually are the stem cells, but I'll, I don't show this here. Uh, but the fact that they are GFP positive, these stem cells allowed us to um, sort them out from, the, from fresh tissue. This is still from mouse. And then uh, stick a single LGR5 positive stem cell, you see it here, day zero, into a 3D type culture. So we use Matrigel inspired by Amina Bissell. Uh, also uh, Toshi Sato did this and we sat down and we uh, knew quite a bit about the growth factor conditions in crypts. We knew that wind was key for driving these stem cells from an old experiment in the lab. Rather than wind, we use the wind amplifier R spondin. It was then unknown how it works. We now know it's actually the ligand of the marker that we have been using LGR5. And we actually solved uh, how, how R spondin amplifies wind signals. I won't talk about it here. So wind, a tyrus and kinase receptor is always important to be triggered. So we do this with EGF. And then again, from an old transgenic mouse experiment, we knew we had to block BMP by a solvent protein called Noggin. Can also be done with a small molecule BMP receptor inhibitor. Um, and the combination of this, these three recombinant proteins, 
in the absence of serum, but cultured in mater gel allowed the following to happen. So we have a single stem cell here. We actually intended to create many stem cells out of that single stem cell. That didn't happen. As you can see here, we get these epithelial structures. You see movies here that run over three or four days. So they're extremely vital. They grow fast. They never stop growing. They've now been growing for many years, uh, despite the fact that these come from mice and mice only live for three years. But surprisingly, what we find is they really are uh, copies of the normal intestinal epithelium. So the central lining of the lumen that you see for me here is, uh, is covered by um, the, all of the different cell types of the gut epithelium. It's about 10 different differentiated cells. And these buds are the Crips of Lieberkuhn equivalent with many stem cells at the base interspersed with another differentiated cell type called dependent cells that in a normal crypt would also be interspersed with stem cells. So the kinetics, the production of cell types, and even the location of cell types in these structures are highly reminiscent of the real tissue. And we therefore term these uh, structures organized. Now, they grow so fast that, uh, that we, but also many other people believe that they must have been transformed under these conditions by sequence immunity never found oncogenic mutations in cultured organoids, unless you start from a tumor, and I'll give examples there later. Um, but the real test to see if these are normal cells was a transplantation. So Toshi and Utrecht sorted a single LG5 cell from, in this case, a colon, not a small intestine, grew them up to about 100 million cells, sent them to, to our collaborators in Tokyo, Mamoru Watanabe and his people, and um, they treated mice with DSS, a chemical that induces a colitis-like syndrome, so large ulcers in a distal colon, infused these organoids through the anuses of about several dozen mice. And uh, in the next few hours, these, these organoids float around. They will not adhere to normal, healthy epithelium, but the moment they send sub-epithelial structures like collagens, they will actually, with their basal site on the outside, so the integrins are on the outside, they will actually recognize these uh, stromal elements, they will bind and open up and like a living band-aid, they cure these lesions. Here you see the real experiment. This is a colon with these orange patches. That's where uh, some of these um, organoids, mini guts, have settled, have opened up. And only by confocal can you find these, uh, these patches. You can see they're nicely red because they come from an RFP-positive mouse in Holland originally, and the rest of the Japanese mouse does, is not fluorescent. And by all means, this is fully, fully functional tissue. When we look at markers, it never develops into cancers. That was, of course, one worry. And the other worry is because of the expansion of the, the stem cells, they would be exhausted and we would lose these patches over time. But that also doesn't seem to be happening. And based on this, Mamoru has gone on. This is an old experiment, uh, almost eight years old. Uh, but he has gone on and uh, is now currently trying to transplant human organoids to human inflammatory bowel disease patients as we speak. So that would be the first in man trial. Now, while we're doing all these experiments, we realize that first of all, LGR5 is not only a marker of active stem cells in the gut, but it looks like it's a marker of active stem cells in any epithelium, be it ectodermal, mesodermal, or endodermal. And you can see a long list of tissues. This is now all human. Now, first of all, we could show that stem cells, when activated, not when they're questioned, but when they're dividing, they are LG5 positive. Um, and also for all of these tissues, we and other labs have developed protocols that always resemble the one I just showed you, that allows one to take, from, take a small bit of tissue, grind it up in small pieces. You don't have to sort out stem cells. You don't have to start from stem cells, but you can actually then plate these, um, these little bits of tissue in major gel and an optimized cocktail of growth factors so usually there's wind there or spawned in. There is a tyrosine kinase receptor activator like EGF or HGF. And there is an inhibitor of BMPTA beta. Memory gland likes estrogens, prostate likes testosterone. But generally, one can come up with a protocol where these little bits of tissue will basically form little cysts. Everything that's not epithelial disappears, dies. So immune cells, et cetera, will not persist. Uh, but these uh, cystic structures will then continue to grow forever. And when one does this well, they'll have all of the cell types of the original tissue, and, and you can really propagate them uh, long term. You can CRISPR, you can um, do all the tests you can do with cell lines or with primary cells also on these organoids. We can do it with healthy tissue. We can also uh, use to model cancer directly from patients. I'll give some examples. Hereditary diseases, I don't show this here, but cystic fibrosis is a fantastic example there. 
And uh, I'll give examples on how to use organoids in infectious disease. Just to give one other example of another organ. So the liver is probably the most regenerative tissue of our body, not under healthy circumstances. Then there's very little cell division, but the moment the liver gets damaged, um, if it hits every hepatocyte in a liver, the cholangiocytes, the bile duct cells will become oval cells. They de-differentiate, they become bispecific and they can then recreate bile duct and hepatocytes. Um, if, uh, for instance, the liver is damaged by trauma or upon surgery, so two thirds of the liver is removed, but a third is left in place, and that part of the liver is healthy, then a very different mechanism comes in place, and that's what I'll show you in the next few slides. Then the hepatocytes essentially become proliferative. So you would call them stem cells, yet they can, in a matter of three weeks, restore a, uh, say, if, if half of the liver has been lost. Now, Hui Li Hu worked very hard, and this was a complex mechanism. This is a paper in Cell, actually in 2018, I believe. Uh, and finally came up with a protocol complex, about 10 different components uh, to stimulate the growth of the stem cells. But she could start from a fully differentiated hepatocyte, so large cells. This is still from a mouse, marked by albumin Cree rosa tomato. So every red cell makes albumin, is the hepatocyte. And you can see that this large cell can go into cell cycle. Here you see that probably produced about four cells. And in a matter of three weeks, it's not the fastest growing organoid, but you can see these beautiful structures that essentially consist entirely of hepatocytes. And this is from human uh, liver. Again, you don't need to sort stem cells, would even not be relevant here because it's the hepatocytes that start dividing. But just a few hepatocytes in culture, right growth factor combination in 3D in Matrigel will give you these uh, long-term expanding uh, human hepatocyte organoids, very large cells. You can see these large nuclei, big nucleoli, staining for the maturation transcription factor HNF for alpha, also for alpha-1 antitrypsin in red. So that's a serum protein very abundantly produced in the liver. You can see that here. They make albumin they have the cytochromes to normal levels. So by all means, these are functional hepatocytes. Yet, as you can see here, they divide uh, occasionally. This is a myto mitosis. Um, and, um, and as such, they can be uh, maintained long term. Another view of a much larger hepatocyte organoid revealed, and I'll go to the next slide, actually that we got even more than we'd hoped for, because here you see the large hepatocytes. Now we stain for uh, MRP2, which is a bile acid transporter. So uh, hepatocytes produce bile acid. They secrete this through their apical domain into a structure that's formed by adjacent apical domains of cells, of hepatocytes. It forms a channel, bile canaliculus. And as you can see here, staining for the bile acid transporter, indeed we get these bile canaliculi formed also in the human organoids. And they feed into a central space. So hepatocytes will secrete bile acid into here, feed into a central space. This is where we think normally the bile duct should be connected, but there are now bile duct cells in this version of the liver organoids. So we get a central space that slowly fills with bile acids. And every once, once in a while it empties itself by basically breaking up and then uh, extruding the, uh, the bile acids into the, uh, into the medium. So really surprising how self-organizing these are. Together with Ipe de Jong in New York, you probably might know him, um, uh, we actually performed a transplantation experiment or Ipe performed a transplantation experiment and Helmut Gehard on our end in Utrecht uh, helped here. So this is a, a transplantation of a human hepatocyte organoid into mice that are deficient for the FAH uh, enzyme here. This actually, when you put these mice on normal food, will lead to the slow destruction of the liver. But if you transplant healthy human hepatocytes in, they will form an island that slowly expands and replaces the uh, the dying mouse liver cells here. And we stain for KI67. This, I believe, is about two months after transplantation, but you can see that we get numerous uh, still divining hepatocytes. Apparently, this island is still growing and is slowly rescuing uh, this mouse. So also, not only for gut, but also for liver, it's possible to take a single cell, grow it up, create a line, transplant, and create functional tissue. I should stress here, though, that the liver organoids, for some reason, we cannot carry indeterminately. So unlike all other organoids that typically we can carry as long as we want and passage and expand as long as we want, liver organoids, depending on the age of the donor, appear to have a more limited lifespan. And eventually they go into senescence 
uh, in a very young individual, this might be after half a year or a year. If it's a human fetal sample, they might grow forever. But an old individual who donated the liver, uh, actually, we'll, we only can keep them for a few months. You can build uh, disease models. I didn't show this here, but, but they are beautiful cells to beautiful organoids to build uh, fatty liver disease models long term. We can CRISPR, we can address which genes are important, we can lock in and lock out things. It's all very easy for some reason in these liver cells. But here, Dai Zhong Wang, a recent Chinese postdoc in the lab in Utrecht, has uh, tried to establish a uh, chronic infectious infection disease model for hepatitis B. Uh, here he does it in uh, actually in 2D. So we play the organoids in 2D. We can keep them al uh, alive for at least two to three months. And in that course, we can infect. And as you can see, we get large amounts of the uh, hepatitis B core antigen expressed. As you see here, we also have a lot of hepatitis B surface antigen secreted. Uh, viral particles are formed. And by all means, it looks like this is a, uh, a platform in which one can model chronic hepatitis B infection. As you might know, uh, a percentage of patients to get infected with HBV, turn their disease into a chronic disease, and this state slowly leads to a liver uh, function loss, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and eventually might also lead to, uh, to liver cancer. So to be able to study chronic infections of human liver hepatocytes, uh, we think is going to be uh, a very useful platform. And this is the steatosis model. Uh, so here we knock out ApoB, um, ApoB is a serum protein, actually the core of the lipoprotein particles. So liver cells needed to secrete newly synthesized uh, lipids. If we knock it out, <clears throat> you see a strong accumulation of lipid droplets in yellow here. And uh, wild types don't do that. However, if we take wild type organoids and we give them uh, high level uh, free fatty acids in the medium, normally there is no lipid in, in medium. We also get very similar uh, accumulation of lipids. And we've actually been able to assess a number of potential target genes for this disease called the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. NASH would be the next stage. Cancer would be the next stage. And uh, there's currently no approved drug for this condition, which is extremely common in the Western world. And again, we think that this, these types of uh, assays might help, platforms might actually help develop therapeutic strategies for these uh, chronic diseases. Moving to cancer, here you see uh, an application that has actually been tried quite widely. It's quite easy to grow cancer cells from um, directly from tumors. And then you can actually you see a list of cancers for which that works well. Uh, you can grow them side by side. On the left, you see healthy tissue. And then on the right, you see cancer tissue. Um, this can be used for drug development. Uh, one can sequence these organoids and get a very clean sequence of the carcinoma because all other cells, but for the cancer cells are lost. And most importantly, we can expose see the sequencing here, but we can expose these organoids to multiple drugs. And in doing so, um, you see that here, we can assess in a personalized fashion if a patient will or will not respond to a particular treatment. Of course, you can also use organoids to develop uh, drugs and that is actually now being pursued by uh, several companies. And this personalized uh, healthcare application, we have done a little bit, but mostly with collaborators. This is what they look like. So healthy and cancer organized from the same patient. But it's already in 2018 and 19, there were a number of papers. This one actually scooped our collaborators here. Beautiful paper. All of these predict, and there are now many more papers that, that do this. All of these predict that these organoids are very predictive. Uh, in 80 to 90% of the cases, they can predict whether a, a cancer patient will or will not respond to a given treatment. Um, the, so that offers a great opportunities possibly for cancer diagnostics. But having said that, it's still a very slow and very expensive uh, platform and one needs very highly trained personnel to do this in the labs. So currently uh, there, there are multiple efforts to see if this can be automated, miniaturized, and actually made a lot cheaper and a lot faster. And there's some indications that that, that is uh, possible. Now, yeah. Uh, here we go. So um, another application in cancer is this. So here we grow uh, cancer organoids. Uh, you see breast cancer organoids here. This is done in collaboration with Anne Rios and Florijn Dekkers in Utrecht. And uh, what Anne has done is developed this incredible, uh, it'll be published soon in Asia Biotech, this incredible imaging platform where she can now document the behavior of the T cells. And these are CAR T cells that carry a 
cancer-specific gamma, gamma delta T cell receptor. If you want to know more about it, you can read that paper that soon come out. Um, and also you can classify the behaviors. And some of these T cells move around like crazy, but they never do anything else. Some don't move at all, but actually some of them turn out to be killer cells. And I'll give some examples here. This one uh, essentially first anchors to an organoid. So the organoid is yellow when it lives and it's red when it dies. And you can see it wraps itself around the organoid. It's now 12 hours into the experiment. And one by one, it kills the cancer cells. And in this case, I would assume there's probably something like 15, 20 cancer cells in this organoid. So a single T cell, peripheral blood T cell, given this gamma delta T cell receptor will bind to cancer cells and will kill them. Another one here uh, on calls is a sling and lasso. So here you see it entering. It sticks out these very long protrusions and sort of strangles uh, cells at a distance. And again, this one also slowly but steadily destroys the uh, organoid that it's actually occupying. And then a last one called the serial killer. This is the most aggressive of the... No, I hope that this... Oh, sorry, I have to... Yeah, sorry, I have to play this movie again. Yeah, here we go. So here's the serial killer. So it um, um, kills, you see multiple cells. It actually drills through the organoids. That's how we can, uh, we can purify them because they actually, if we spin the organoids down after two or three hours, they will be inside the organoids. And we have a very good signature of these cells. Kills a few more cells, runs around, kills a few more cells in this organoid, and then it disappears in the sunset. And we see that about two to 3% of the T cells have this behavior. So they would be extremely useful as CAR T cells in patients. And we're hoping that with the signature that we now have of these uh, T cells, we can uh, identify them better and maybe find conditions where we can uh, enrich for these T cells or drive other cells into this particular phenotype. And then if I'm allowed to have, a, I think, a final story yeah, on uh, COVID-19. Um, when we went in lockdown two years ago, uh, we were only allowed to do uh, COVID research. And we realized early on, this is March 2020, that ACE2, that was already known to be the receptor for, for the virus, for SARS-CoV-2, is most highly expressed in the gut. So clearly, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an airway infection, a lung infection. But we asked, can it also infect uh, the gastrointestinal tract? And that would have uh, uh, repercussions for, for instance, transfer of the virus, transmission of the virus. So there's high ACE2, there were also nausea, diarrhea, stomach ache symptoms in COVID-19 patients, pretty common. And then when the first PCR test became available, it was clear that viral RNA could be detected in stool, implying that possibly not, on, not only the lungs, not only the airways, but also the intestinal tract was a target of the virus. Now we could address this with these organoids and actually in the, indeed lung organoids get infected readily. We collaborated with Mark Lamers and Bart Haagmans in Rotterdam, uh, Corona, big Corona lab in Holland. Um, and, and together we found actually that intestinal organoids are even better targets for the virus than the airway organoids. There's a 10 log, uh, sorry, 4 log, 10 increase in viruses in less than three days in live viral particles, but also in RNA. And this both holds for uh, SARS, the original SARS virus in blue, and SARS-CoV-2 in red. When we stay for SARS-CoV-2, we know that it enters through the apical domain, so from the luminal side of the organoids, also from the luminal side of airways or guts, because that's where ACE2 sits. It's, it becomes important for my final few slides. So ACE2 sits here, enters the body through the airways or into the acetyl tract. In fact, we stain for nuclear protein here in white, so this is a single infected cell. By EM, we see that the virus is, is extruded again to the lumen, to the apical surface. And indeed, three days later, two days later, we see that now the virus is spread through the entire organoid, yet uninfected organoids remain uninfected. Uh, and that's clear because the virus will never leave the organoid from the basal side, it will always go into the lumen. There's a lot of RNA-seq and things like that, but that didn't reveal much more. But this actually shows that one can use organoids to, test, to study uh, tissue tropism of viruses. We then ask, this paper is now submitted, we then ask what are the host genes that are required for the virus to be replicated? Now, one, of course, is ACE2. Indeed, when we knock out ACE2 by CRISPR, we make clonal organoids, we sequence, so we 
we know we have two null alleles in these organoids. There's two independent clones. So these are one, four wild type clones happily infected. The mutants that don't have the SARS-CoV-2 receptor ACE2 are not infected as expected. Same thing for SARS, which uses the same ACE2 receptor, but MERS, a third member of this uh, subfamily of viruses, actually happily infects. For MERS, it's known that it uses DPP4 as its receptor. When we knock out DPP4, now MERS no longer infects, but now SARS-CoV-2 happily infects. By the way, there are some papers claiming that DPP4 is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. So we don't confirm that. At least we don't confirm that DPP4 is essential for SARS-CoV-2 in, uh, in, uh, in epithelium. We then went through a long list of, of genes. So, uh, there were a number of genome-wide CRISPR screens done. Uh, many of the genes in those lists were endocytosis genes. We could actually not confirm any of those genes in the list beyond uh, ACE2 uh, that I already showed you. And for instance, cathepsin L, which is a strong hit in most of these studies, if anything, enhances infectivity, as you can see here, the purple line. And the only other gene that was not picked up in the genome-wide screens, by the way, is TEMPRS2 which has a very well-known function for viral infection. It is a transmembrane protease that after the virus binds to ACE2 will cleave, temp will cleave the spike protein and this now merges, fuses the viral envelope with the host membrane. One other observation I want to show and then I'll, I'll end. So chloroquine, you are probably well aware of this, was, was proposed as a drug for SARS-CoV-2 early on. It's probably used by hundreds of thousands of patients or it's, it's uh, cousin uh, hydroxychloroquine. In our hands, it's actually, as published originally, a very efficient blocker of infection in the typical cell lines used in virology labs, like VRE6. VRE6 is a African green monkey cell line, looks a bit like a fibroblast. At one micromolar, we get the IC50. At 10 micromolar, essentially, there is no infection. If we now take the 10 micromolar concentration and we expose our organoids, here in blue to uh, 10 micromolar chloroquine, um, essentially we see no effect. So chloroquine in organoids does not block the virus. Now, how do we explain this? What we think happens in these uh, fibroblasts, and we, I should say, there are several other papers that, that uh, show the same thing. So these very sick cells, the virus will bind. Often in these cell lines, one has to transfect in ACE2 because they're not really polarized epithelial cells, they don't have ACE2, so you transfect it in, it binds. Now the virus gets endocytosed and it has to be released from the endosome. Uh, and this requires, uh, for instance, the proteases cathepsin L and B. This step is fully hydroxychloroquine sensitive, explaining why in very sick cells, uh, the virus can be blocked with chloroquine, but what happens in these epithelial cells, and we and multiple other researchers propose, is that the virus never enters the host cell, it actually binds to ACE2, then tempers to the transmembrane uh, protease moves in, it cleaves uh, the spike protein, this now allows the viral envelope to merge, to fuse directly with the host membrane, and the viral genome is directly injected into the host cell. So there's no endocytosis, therefore there is no sensitivity to chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, and there's no dependence on all of these uh, um, endocytosis genes. So based on this, we propose that actually it might be of interest, you know, for any future virus that if one tries to find drugs to treat those uh, those infections, um, these cells work very well and are easy to work with, but maybe one should always include a step where one uses more, the tissue that's more like primary epithelia, like the cells one sees in, uh, in organoids. And that I think I mentioned uh, uh, the collaborators and people in my lab who were involved in this. And I'll thank you very much for your attention and I'll stop share. Yes, thank you. Thank you for very exciting talk. and. Uh beautiful movie so, uh, and beautiful science. So um, now we will move to the next speaker. And for the audience, if you have any question, please type your question in the Q&C session and we'll discuss at the end. And Engine, are you, are you there? Yes, yes, sorry, I'm here, absolutely. So um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker who is uh, Dr. Shen Ding. Uh, he is Bayer Distinguished Professor and Dean of the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Tsinghao University in China. Dr. Ding has pioneered the development of innovative chemical approaches to stem cell uh, biology. He is internationally recognized for his seminal contributions to the fields of stem cell biology and drug discovery. Uh, 
He's the founding institute director of the Global Health Drug Discovery Institute in Beijing, a joint venture by Tsinghao University and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Ding also holds an appointment as the William K. Bowes Jr. Distinguished Investigator at Gladstone Institutes and Professor at the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, University of California, San Francisco. He obtained his PhD in chemistry with honors from Caltech before moving to the Scripps Institute to complete his PhD in chemistry in 20, 2003. Dr. Ding held assistant and associate professor appointments at Scripps until uh, 2011 and then moved to Gladstone and UCSF as senior investigator and professor until 2016 before his current appointments. Dr. Ding, thank you very much. We look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this very kind introduction. Uh, also, uh, it's my great honor to be invited and also present uh, our work today uh, at this uh, digital forum uh, of International Chemical Biology Society. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, uh, my laboratory uh, has been really applying a chemical biology approach uh, to understand and uh, control uh, cell fate and function uh, almost uh, uh, nearly uh, 20, uh, two decades. So today uh, I'm gonna tell you uh, three uh, very recent stories, uh, mostly unpublished, uh, centered around uh, using our uh, chemical approaches uh, toward uh, creating uh, what we call creating, uh, regenerating, and extending life. So, um, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, my lab has been uh, really uh, screening for small molecules that can really control uh, cell fate and function. Uh, one uh, particular uh, paradigm uh, we uh, envisioned uh, is really uh, the, the, the following. So um, um, in, in a fibroblast, uh, certainly we can expose uh, temporally um, uh, those fibroblasts with uh, reprogramming factors. Uh, and essentially uh, those, uh, those cells uh, can be uh, activated uh, in an epigenetic uh, manner into an uh, induced uh, transition state. Um, when we uh, continue actually to expose or to treat uh, those cells uh, with the reprogramming factors also under uh, appropriate conditions, uh, certainly we all know uh, induced or uh, proponent stem cells uh, can be generated, uh, uh, pioneered by, by Shinya uh, et al. Uh, uh, from uh, 2006. And today uh, I'm going to tell you how actually we, we go on uh, to further actually uh, induce uh, those cells uh, to induce total potency. But also, um, as uh, my lab uh, has uh, been working on, um, uh, when we actually uh, only expose uh, those uh, induced uh, uh, transition state uh, population uh, for, uh, for, for temporal, uh, in a temporal manner, but also at the same time, uh, expose them actually, or treat them with other uh, signaling uh, molecules, uh, tissue specific precursor cells uh, can be generated. Uh, so I, I won't actually uh, uh, outline uh, many of those uh, studies. Uh, so essentially, uh, this paradigm actually uh, is rather uh, simple uh, and general for, uh, for inducing uh, various cell type generation. And also importantly, uh, given uh, the temporal manner uh, of uh, those reprogramming factor treatment, uh, those actually, uh, when, when actually initially uh, uh, transcription factors were used for reprogramming, uh, uh, essentially, uh, many of those, or all of those, actually can be uh, replaced by small molecules. Uh, certainly, this approach actually uh, really generate a defined uh, stem cell uh, or, or, uh, or tissue specific uh, cell type, which can be isolated, expanded, uh, importantly, maintained and characterized uh, before they can be uh, used for various applications. So, uh, one specific example, uh, my lab. Uh, has been working on it's really uh, uh, has been uh, it's really about towards uh, creating life, um, which actually uh, can uh, uh, can occur uh, through uh, naturally through uh, fertilization uh, to really generate a so-called uh, totipotent cells. So essentially, uh, when one can create uh, totipotent cells, perhaps a um, uh, uh, life can be uh, subsequently uh, created uh, from that. Uh, and also we know actually totipotent cells uh, uh, can be actually generated uh, through uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer uh, using uh, oocyte, essentially uh, not, uh, sort of a one kind of uh, germline cells. 
we basically uh, ask uh, one specific question, uh, can totipotent cells be induced for, from uh, non-germline uh, cells? So how uh, we go about sort of uh, uh, this specific uh, question? Uh, so again, we approach this uh, uh, using a chemical biology approach uh, where uh, initially we conducted a uh, chemical uh, screening uh, to look for small molecules that can really induce uh, markers uh, with uh, uh, totipotency uh, uh, specific uh, features. Uh, one particular marker we used uh, is called uh, 2C uh, uh, or Marvel. Uh, um, uh, this is really a, a, a retro sort of elements and that is really specifically uh, expressed only in this uh, totipotent uh, a stage. Uh, so using this uh, reporter uh, cell line, uh, we sort of conducted our screen initially for small molecules uh, that can really uh, highly induce uh, this specific marker expression, but also subsequently we uh, um, further screened uh, the initial hits uh, with actually silencing of uh, out for uh, uh, this uh, prepotency marker. Again, from uh, those uh, serial sort of screening, and then we actually uh, uh, did a, a combinatorial a testing, essentially really combine uh, different molecules together using, uh, uh, and then use RNA-seq, uh, sort of a more uh, transcriptome gene expression analysis to really uh, analyze actually uh, which combination can really induce uh, a totipotency. So uh, uh, ultimately uh, we actually uh, came up on this specific uh, combination we called uh, TA uh, TAW, uh, sort of a three small molecule combination. Uh, as you can see here, actually, uh, through this RNA-seq analysis, uh, we, we found uh, this specific combination remarkably induce uh, cells that actually closely resemble uh, a 2C stage uh, totipotent uh, sort of embryo. So we went on actually uh, to further characterize the TAW uh, sort of a tau induced uh, totipotent cells by, by the bulk uh, RNA-seq uh, analysis, um, um, we actually, uh, again, can really confirm uh, the, the tau-treated uh, cell population uh, at, this, uh, uh, at this population level actually really uh, express uh, key uh, sort of a totipotency uh, genes, into, uh, including those uh, maternal genes, uh, ZGA genes, uh, and other uh, sort of well-characterized uh, totipotency genes. Uh, this is really in contrast uh, to, um, to many other uh, sort of a cell, uh, uh, cell types uh, previously reported to exhibit a certain uh, totipotency uh, gene expression. And also uh, this specific gene expression feature are very much uh, resemble uh, 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 2C stage uh, embryo uh, in terms of uh, this uh, totipotency uh, specific stage. So to further uh, confirm this uh, and also to examine uh, the cell uh, heterogeneity, uh, we conduct a uh, single cell uh, RNA-seq analysis. Uh, um, so initially uh, we look at uh, by a PCA analysis, uh, we can really demonstrate um, uh, our uh, chemically induced uh, totipotent uh, uh, stem cell, uh, we call uh, 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 CI uh, toti stem cell. Uh, uh, um, uh, among different passages actually really uh, 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 close to sort of a 2C stage, very closely uh, clustered actually uh, in this PCA plot uh, with actually 2C uh, stage embryo uh, actually are, are distinct actually from, uh, uh, from late stage uh, blastocysts uh, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, many other sort of cell types uh, previously reported uh, to exhibit certain uh, totipotency gene expression. So certainly this can be further confirmed by a more detailed uh, single cell analysis, for example, using the, the UMAP, uh, uh, the, the popular sort of established uh, um, uh, bioinformatic analysis. Again, sort of in this uh, plot, uh, you can well appreciate actually um, uh, uh, our chemically induced uh, uh, TOTI stem cells actually uh, really cluster uh, between sort of uh, uh, or, or near the sort of a 2C, uh, late uh, 2C uh, embryo uh, between sort of a, a middle and late uh, 2C sort of a, a embryo, to this totipotency stage. Uh, and again, sort of distinct from later uh, developmental stage uh, as well as distinct from uh, many other uh, previously uh, reported cell. Uh, again, uh, only uh, is, express a certain uh, totipotency uh, genes. Uh, so, but also actually we can, uh, 
uh, further zooming uh, to look at actually uh, those uh, more uh, well characterized uh, uh, totipotency genes uh, as well as actually pluripotency genes. Essentially, what we can demonstrate here uh, at a single cell level, uh, those chemically induced uh, totipotent stem cells uh, really express uh, uh, quite actually uh, uniformly uh, those totipotency uh, specific genes. Uh, well, actually, those pluripotency genes are, are nearly uh, completely silenced uh, again, sort of this uh, specific uh, gene expression feature uh, very much uh, resemble uh, the uh, sort of uh, the, the middle uh, or, or late uh, um, two C stage embryo, uh, again, distinct actually from a later stage uh, developmental stage uh, embryos, uh, as well as uh, uh, many other sort of uh, uh, cell types uh, previously reported. So we went on actually uh, to do some additional uh, molecular uh, characterizations. Uh, so again, I won't go into the details uh, of those analysis essentially uh, by looking at uh, the methylation, the methylome uh, by ataxic, uh, as well as actually looking at uh, a metabolomic sort of analysis, we can uh, again reach uh, very much uh, the same conclusion uh, or can be used uh, uh, totally stem cells uh, 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 very closely resemble um, uh, authentic uh, two C stage uh, uh, embryo, uh, um, and and distinct uh, from uh, from other uh, sort of a stage uh, uh, stages of embryos. So we uh, so those are the molecular uh, characterizations uh, we perform uh, to really confirm and establish uh, those cells uh, resemble uh, two C stage uh, embryos. Uh, in, in total potency. Uh, subsequently, we uh, performed a functional analysis uh, to really uh, uh, analyze uh, whether they actually have uh, the, the, uh, the potential uh, uh, to become um, uh, embryonic as well as, well as ex-embryonic uh, uh, cell types, uh, which is again a, a distinction from a prepotent uh, cell types. Uh, so uh, first, actually, we conducted a, a uh, in vitro differentiation, uh, where uh, which I didn't actually include data here, uh, you can uh, look up our uh, sort of online publication. Uh, essentially, we can demonstrate uh, our uh, only pretty much our uh, um, chemically induced uh, touch stem cells actually can well uh, differentiate into uh, lineages um, uh, in the extra embryonic. Uh, lineages, but the, most importantly, uh, in this in vivo experiments, uh, we're actually we would inject a single cell uh, into uh, the A cell uh, embryo uh, or even two cell embryo, and then actually uh, implant uh, the embryo sort of uh, uh, in vivo to look at their uh, in vivo development and contribution. So through those sort of stringent uh, imaging analysis as well as a single cell analysis, uh, we can actually uh, firmly confirm. Um, uh, our uh, chemically induced uh, total stem cells actually can contribute uh, both to embryonic uh, uh, and uh, extra embryonic uh, lineages uh, in a quite robust manner. So we also begin to, uh, um, uh, um, to perform some uh, preliminary early uh, mechanistic uh, characterizations. Um, so, um, so, uh, so initially, uh, we can, uh, we, uh, from the gene expression analysis, we can show actually all three uh, chemical components uh, are essential for, for inducing and, and uh, maintaining uh, the totipotent state uh, withdrawal. Any of those actually uh, would diminish uh, totipotency uh, gene expression, a different set of sort of a totipotency gene expression, uh, uh, whereas you are currently uh, further characterizing those uh, enriched uh, pathway. Uh, and particularly, uh, we, we, we looked at uh, sort of a few uh, hypotheses were, were discovered from those uh, gene expression analysis. For example, uh, to look at uh, actually TTNPB, uh, this specific compound, uh, which is uh, known as the RAR specific uh, agonist, uh, we can demonstrate actually RAR bending elements uh, are well sort of uh, uh, enriched in the regulatory region uh, in, in maternal uh, specific uh, genes. Uh, to look at actually uh, uh, AKP, uh, this uh, AKP, uh, AKP, this specific compound, in addition to uh, its known uh, mechanism uh, in regulating uh, inhibiting GSK3 beta and the subsequently uh, activating uh, the, the uh, TCF, um, uh, TCF4 uh, um, uh, wound pathway, uh, we can also show actually uh, this compound 
uh, perhaps actually affect a uh, total potency modulation through a uh, cell cycle modulation uh, in a manner actually um, exhibited uh, also by total potent uh, cells. Uh, finally, uh, we also uh, look at um, uh, compound WS6. Uh, again, through this uh, differential gene expression analysis, uh, we found quite interestingly, uh, this compound actually affect uh, innate uh, immunity, uh, innate sort of immune uh, mechanism, uh, perhaps uh, relevant uh, to or related to, um, uh, to totipotent cell, uh, where actually uh, a lot of uh, uh, retro uh, elements uh, uh, were ancient DNA sort of uh, uh, are, are somewhat uh, expressed to a certain level. And lastly, uh, uh, we also uh, began some uh, sort of early experiment to look at the uh, blastocyst uh, formation. Uh, as you can see here, our, our chemically induced uh, totipotent cells actually uh, can, can uh, efficiently form a uh, uh, blastocyst-like structure and also with uh, um, sort of a cells uh, expressing uh, uh, correct uh, corresponding markers uh, in the right sort of a place. Uh, so, uh, so those are, are still early. Uh, we're hoping actually uh, continued uh, characterization and optimization of those conditions can ultimately lead to a generation uh, or creation sort of a, 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 of a live animal uh, in, the, uh, in the future. In the remaining uh, uh, perhaps sort of uh, uh, 10 minutes, uh, I'll uh, walk you through uh, two unpublished uh, stories uh, where actually we approach in vivo reprogramming towards uh, regenerating and extending life. Um, essentially, uh, the, the concept uh, uh, we've been really advocating uh, over, the two, uh, over the last two decades is really about, again, funding the small molecule that can really uh, control uh, cell fate and then actually uh, 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 treat uh, sort of a, a you know, animal model, but ultimately uh, in, in human setting, um, 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 treat, uh, treat sort of uh, um, uh, the patient actually uh, with those um, uh, cell fate modulating small molecules uh, in a, a tissue a selective manner. And again, through a cell activation uh, endogenous um, in situ cell activation expansion differentiation or reprogramming to really uh, repair or regenerate a specific tissue in the organ. Um, so um, the way actually we're approaching uh, this is really uh, it's really about first actually uh, to work with well characterized cell types involved uh, were lost in disease or, or, or injury condition and then to really identify and characterize small molecules uh, modulating sort of a such reprogramming. Uh, uh, modulating reprogram of sort of really such cell type in vitro and then actually examining the small molecules effect and the mechanism in animal model of relevant disease. Uh, um, um, here are just sort of, uh, three examples uh, we previously published, but today uh, I'm going to tell you sort of a one unpublished story where we look at actually uh, regenerations uh, in heart. As many of you may know, actually heart is perhaps the least regenerative uh, uh, sort of organ uh, in, in our body. Uh, and again, um, uh, some of you may know sort of reprogramming actually or de-differentiation to tissue specific uh, uh, precursor cells from really a mature or, or terminally differentiated cell, cell type like cardiomyocyte is really a natural regenerative mechanism. Uh, and uh, uh, for, for that um, uh, understanding uh, and hypothesis, uh, we, uh, we, we propose uh, perhaps a reprogramming cardiomyocyte, really mature cardiomyocyte, non-proliferated uh, uh, cell type uh, into uh, SL1 positive cardiac precursor cells uh, may actually lead to heart regeneration. So for, for this, to answer this specific question, uh, we conduct sort of a screen using human embryonic stem cell derived uh, mature cardiomyocytes uh, and the screen for uh, small molecules that can really activate uh, uh, ISL1, uh, uh, this specific uh, gene expression uh, representing sort of a cardiac uh, precursor cells. Through sort of a, this, again, through sort of this uh, primary screening and subsequent uh, combination studies, uh, we found actually two uh, specific small molecules. Uh, one is really a signaling molecule, another is really epigenetic modifier. Uh, that combination actually really in induced robust uh, ISL1 uh, expression uh, from uh, from from our, our cardiomyocyte culture, 
uh, as you can see here in the treaty uh, culture, actually, there's really no uh, SL1 induction, but in the treaty culture, actually, uh, there's quite robust, actually, uh, SL1 uh, induction uh, from those cardiomyocyte culture, human cardiomyocyte culture. But uh, to really uh, root out, actually, uh, those uh, SL1 expression might actually arise from uh, uh, perhaps rare uh, existing SL1 uh, culture. Uh, we actually uh, used sort of a, uh, generated uh, uh, SL1 I'm Cherry um, knocking sort of a, a reporter uh, uh, cell line um, and then really um, uh, 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 sort of a purify actually uh, the, the uh, SL1 I'm Cherry negative uh, cardiomyocytes and then actually treat those uh, um, uh, SL1 negative or cardiomyocyte population with our small molecule. So again, sort of here we can show um, basically uh, uh, again, those uh, those initially uh, SL1 negative uh, cardiomyocyte actually can be well induced to express uh, uh, SL1 uh, um, uh, expression. So uh, uh, another way to really sort of a better characterize uh, this is it's actually doing a sort of a, a, a pretty standard linear tracing. In this case, actually, we use a cardiac troponin sort of a, a uh, drive uh, uh, um, uh, ERT CRE to really permanently label uh, cardiomyocytes uh, with GIP and then purify, really purify those uh, GIP labeled uh, GIP positive cells and then actually treat them with our uh, common combination. Uh, again, in this case, uh, we can sort of uh, uh, well detect uh, SL1 uh, induction actually from those lineage, lineage traced uh, GIP positive uh, cardiomyocytes uh, in a very much similar uh, efficiency. So those studies really uh, established actually this specific uh, chemical combination uh, can really induce uh, um, uh, uh, mature uh, human cardiomyocytes into uh, SL1 uh, positive uh, precursor sort of a stage. Uh, we also perform uh, some additional uh, in vitro uh, characterizations to really demonstrate this. But here I just want to show you sort of a couple slides where actually we apply this in vivo. Uh, to really uh, to demonstrate actually this perhaps can uh, can ultimately uh, lead to sort of in vivo regeneration uh, in the heart. So initially we look at actually um, both mouse and rat uh, purified uh, primary cardiomyocyte whether they can be uh, also uh, induced uh, by this uh, sp specific uh, chemical combination. So both in, in, in mouse and rat actually can demonstrate a primary cardiomyocyte can also be sort of uh, induced to, uh, to express ISL1. But also just if we treat sort of rats uh, actually with uh, the compound uh, directly in vivo actually by section, uh, sectioning through the heart actually, we can also detect uh, a certain sort of regions actually also uh, uh, with uh, SL1 uh, specifically induced. And finally, uh, sort of in a more uh, relevant uh, uh, animal model, uh, but in this case, uh, a very much uh, prophylactic condition where we envision perhaps uh, for patients actually um, with sort of a heart failure or declining heart function, uh, whether actually they can potentially benefit from this type of regenerative approach. So in this uh, particular model, actually, when we uh, prophylactic, um, prophylactically uh, treat sort of uh, the mouth and then perform a uh, myocardial sort of infarct, uh, we can uh, demonstrate actually uh, by both survival and the, and the uh, ejection sort of a fraction, uh, there's uh, there's sort of a, a, a improvement uh, suggesting actually uh, this type of uh, de-differentiation from mature cardiomyocyte to precursor cells uh, may actually have a therapeutic uh, potential. And finally, uh, in the remaining perhaps uh, a couple of minutes, uh, I'll, I'll tell you sort of the last story uh, in my talk today. Uh, this is really about our efforts uh, towards uh, using a chemical approach to extend uh, life. Um, uh, some of you may know sort of the IPSC reprogramming process uh, really rejuvenate uh, cells. However, uh, we know uh, this reprogramming process also change cell fate. So the, the, uh, the key to really harness uh, reprogramming process to, uh, to rejuvenate uh, or to reverse uh, cell age, uh, uh, it's, really to, it's really about really identifying a key reprogramming mechanism uh, that uh, that mostly or only sort of reverse cell weight, uh, re reverse cell age 
uh, not actually changing sort of a cell identity or cell type. Uh, previously, actually, um, my lab actually uh, uh, published a study where we showed uh, uh, sort of uh, autophagy uh, is a metabolic program actually uh, regulating mitochondrial clearance. It's really essential for IPSC reprogramming. And, and this, uh, this process actually does not really change uh, cell identity or self, uh, cell fate, uh, only actually or mostly impact on, on, on cell age. So, so subsequently, uh, we perform some additional sort of temporal screening, uh, looking for small molecules modulating uh, this uh, uh, autophagic sort of a process, uh, rejuvenation process, and 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 we hope actually this can lead to sort of initially testing those molecules in the relevant disease model uh, in indication, and ultimately uh, to really about uh, sort of ameliorating sort of aging. So to really find uh, a lysosome uh, and, and autophagy specific uh, uh, activators that is uh, different from well-known uh, TOR inhibitor uh, or many other actually uh, molecules are uh, actually highly toxic uh, to, to cells. We actually uh, perform sort of screening using this uh, tandem uh, dual reporter, LC3 dual reporter uh, assay. And, and really importantly, subsequently to examine and filter through those molecules actually using a, a, a lysosome specific disease model. Uh, so so we, we're actually used a cell and three sort of disease model. Cell and three is really a lysosome protein and this specific uh, a deletion uh, of uh, exon uh, seven and eight actually really results in lysosome dysfunction and battery disease. So we, we thought actually this specific model can help us actually to uh, identify actually distinct uh, sort of a really therapeutically relevant uh, molecules. So, so again, sort of using this disease model, uh, uh, cell line actually we, we filtered our, our heat and actually remarkably we found actually one specific molecule, uh, compound G actually uh, can really uh, ameliorate actually this uh, disease phenotype. As you can see here, compared to wild type actually, the CLN3 sort of the neuronal cells actually uh, really had a, a poor uh, survival, a lot of cell deaths uh, and again treatment with uh, this compound actually can restore cell uh, cell health uh, and the cell sort of uh, 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 cell uh, healthy cell state. Again, actually looking at the specific uh, proteins accumulated actually in the cell and three disease, uh, we can show actually treatment that actually can can well sort of lead to a clearance of those accumulated uh, protein. Again, by looking at actually lysosome CT and also lysosome function, actually we can confirm uh, this compound actually really has this robust remarkable uh, effect uh, on restoring uh, lysosome function uh, while still actually uh, uh, um, maintaining a very uh, sort of healthy state uh, of cells um, uh, in contrast with uh, many other sort of previously reported um, uh, autophagy modulator like the TOR inhibitor. Here is sort of a, in a, a CLN3 knockout animal model uh, where actually uh, we can again specifically uh, look at actually uh, protein sort of uh, due to the level of some uh, uh, dysfunction, a certain protein sort of accumulation, uh, 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 as well as actually gliosis, uh, inflammation, uh, and also sort of a, a water maze assay, as, as well as a, a, a rotor was sort of a, 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 a assay. So again, sort of in, in those uh, different assays uh, performed actually with uh, CLN3 knockout mice uh, and also treated with compound we can uh, we can really uh, demonstrate actually this compound at least uh, can actually uh, partially rescue the disease uh, phenotype, uh, restore sort of uh, 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 health actually to, to this uh, knockout animal. So this, uh, this uh, may represent actually a, a potential uh, treatment for, for this, uh, for, this uh, for the baton disease are currently still with no, uh, no effective uh, treatment. So mechanistically, we found actually this molecule really uh, induced uh, P62 uh, uh, activation uh, and also uh, subsequent, uh, and again, uh, we can show actually P62 overexpression uh, actually can restore, you know, lysosome um, uh, function uh, as well as actually uh, lead, lead to clearance of uh, in, uh, the, the, uh, the accumulated protein uh, in the cell and three uh, um, uh, animal model uh, as well as cell model. So finally, uh, I would just like to acknowledge uh, um, uh, uh, people uh, in my lab and, and, and my collaborators. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have a large number of uh, very talented students actually uh, who really deserve 
uh, the credits actually uh, perform uh, the study uh, I have time to tell you today, as well as many other ongoing uh, studies, uh, which uh, hopefully uh, I would have a chance to uh, tell you uh, uh, later. Uh, also, we're very grateful to our, our collaborators, uh, as well as uh, those funding agencies. I'll stop here and perhaps answer questions later. Thank you, Dr. Ding, for an excellent talk. And I have no doubt that there will be many questions. If you have a question, please, can you use the Q&A box? Type your questions in there, and then we will take them at the end. Um, now, I would like to introduce the third speaker for the session. This is Dr. Bridget Wagner. She is Director of Pancreatic Cell Biology and Metabolic Disease within the Chemical, Biology, and Therapeutic Science Program at the Broad Institute in the United States. Her group focuses on the chemical biology of diabetes with the aim of identifying small molecules capable of increasing pancreatic beta cell number and function, and with the ultimate goal of discovering new therapeutic approaches for diabetes. Dr. Wagner uh, received her AB from Harvard College and her PhD from the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology at Harvard University. She has been instrumental in driving the development of the broad chemical biology program since 2000, uh, 20, 2003, forgive me. She is the recipient of the 2008 Type 1 Diabetes Pathfinder Award from the NIH and a Transformative Research Award from the NIH in 2016. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wagner. We look forward to your talk. Thanks, Adrian, and, and thank you and Chu Bing for this great digital forum and for the opportunity to talk to, to the audience about some of our work in uh, the beta cell. In this case, uh, we're going to talk a little bit less about stem cells themselves, but rather something of a, of a natural organoid in the, in the pancreatic islet. To set the stage a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about a background of, of diabetes itself. Now, you may already know, but, but across the entire globe, diabetes is really, even according to the IDF, the International Diabetes Foundation, spiraling out of control. Over half a billion people worldwide have diabetes, and even more concerningly, um, uh, quite a few patients uh, or soon to be patients uh, do not even know they have diabetes or in, or in a pre-diabetic state. So it's really affecting such a, a huge portion of, of the global population. However, when, when you think about how one is uh, diagnosed with diabetes, it is not at all informative of the mechanism itself. It's entirely uh, phenotypic in, in a human sense. Fasting plasma glucose being above a certain level, um, the response to, to plasma glucose, for example, you might um, fast, drink a sugary drink, and then see how the body can tolerate that. Or uh, more precisely, the A1C, the, hem the glycated hemoglobin levels are a good measure of glucose, blood glucose in the past few months. These together help to determine whether a patient is diabetic or whether a patient is, uh, you know, uh, having impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fast, fasting glucose. But as I mentioned, it's not at all telling us how does this happen and, and why, and how can we therefore treat it? My group, as, as Adrian mentioned, focuses on the pancreatic beta cell. How did we arrive there? Well, it's, it's really about genetics. And I think the genome-wide association studies of the early 2000s across uh, thousands of patients, tens of thousands of patients with uh, Diet, type 2 diabetes in particular, showed that, that a number of the variants, these are highlighted here in yellow, these are variants associated uh, to a particular gene, and the carriers of these genes tend to, even when non-diabetic, tended to have worse indicators of beta cell function and not really measurement of, of insulin resistance. For a long time, for decades, it's been questioned whether diabetes occurs because of insulin resistance or because the beta cell fails. And I think a lot of the genetics evidence is pointing towards a really critical role for the beta cell in the, in the ultimate development of diabetes. That's not to say insulin resistance is important as well, but um, I think this has led to a lot of neglect over the years of the beta cell in terms of a therapeutic 
uh, cellular target. Very briefly, uh, very high level, type 1 diabetes, uh, there, there are two major types of diabetes. Type 1 is an autoimmune disease that proceeds in stages, really measured as, as functional beta cell mass that remains. And um, over time, by the time one actually presents with symptoms uh, shown here, let me just grab my laser pointer. Uh, by the time in the late stages when symptoms are actually presenting, uh, patients often have lost up to 80% or more of their beta cell mass in the pancreas. Right now, um, we don't know how to regenerate those lost beta cells. Um, unlike, unfortunately, um, the beautiful work that, that, that Hans presented on, on hepatocyte regeneration, the beta cell doesn't seem to operate in the same manner. And so finding ways to, to restore that lost beta cell mass could be um, potentially curative. Type two, on the, the other hand, is, is represents over 90% of all diabetes cases, and it really represents a whole body disease where every organ is affected. As mentioned, my group focuses on the pancreatic islet, and there are uh, a few very relevant uh, drugs that, uh, that hone in on, on that area of biology. But a lot of the other drugs developed have, have really dealt with a lot of the symptoms and maybe not the root cause of disease. Importantly, it was being discovered in the last decade that, that insulin secretion itself uh, is lost. So normal glucose tolerance, you can see that uh, when, when given a glucose bolus, um, there is a, a fast spike, a first phase of insulin secretion. And this is very much lost in type 2 diabetes. So it's not only number, but function as well. And that uh, in the same vein, the, um, the, the response to glucose with insulin secretion is qualitatively as well as quantitatively lost. So it's not just that this, this line is shifted downwards, the slope itself changes, which represents the, the inability of beta cells to compensate for higher glucose over time as one becomes diabetic. So ways in, in therefore to increase beta cell function this is the hypothetical intervention, or to increase cell mass um, could really restore uh, normal glycemia in diabetic patients. So my group, again, we'll get back to the beta cell. How do we do this? Well, we take phenotypic strategies. We don't uh, do screening for particular targets, but rather whole cell screening. And we, we take a number of different approaches. We're looking for compounds that can increase beta cell proliferation itself, um, beta cells that can restore or promote beta cell survival, so prevent the loss of the beta cell in the first place. We're looking for small molecules that could promote insulin secretion. And then uh, we're also looking for small molecules that, uh, you know, maybe more provocatively could induce transdifferentiation of other cell types into a beta-like state. To do this, however, we've, we've really had a lot of, of struggle with what's the right cell type to use. And when we started these projects many years ago, the wonderful stem cell-based approaches to generate induced uh, beta cells and induced um, islet cell types were not in really in existence. So we wanted to look closely at uh, the differences between, for example, human islets, rodent islets, different cell lines. And it was very clear to us uh, examining, examining the literature that um, particular phenotypes, especially proliferation, we really need to be using human cells. Rodent cells react quite differently to different stimuli. And a very interesting paper uh, about 10 years ago, looking at the cytoarchitecture of different islets from uh, species revealed quite large differences where the mouse islet typically has this core of beta cells surrounded by a mantle of alpha cells and other cell types. But as you proceed up the evolutionary tree closer to humans, you can see that actually the, the beta cells and alpha cells have a lot more communication in a human islet and, um, and have a greater interspersal. And, and I think this is gonna be important for how cells respond to different therapies. 
So therefore, arriving at the conclusion that we need to use human cells, which cell types do we use? Again, as I mentioned, when we started this work, the stem cell derived beta cells were not in, in existence, but crucial to our work was, was access to human islets. And this is a very special uh, network developed across the United States. Uh, it's called the IIDP, the Integrated Islet Distribution Program, where we have uh, now five, unfortunately, I think it was uh, 13 in the past, but uh, five centers of, of excellence that are responsible for isolating pancreatic islets from cadaveric donors for either direct transplants into patients with very brittle type one diabetes or for direct research by uh, scientists like myself. Once we got the human islets in our lab though, um, it was clear that you can't just put them in a plate and screen them. Um, the cells kind of die right away, they spread out and, and form um, and the fibroblasts really take over in the cell culture. So we needed to really develop a new system to, to do this kind of screening. And to, to do that, we uh, developed a, a nice surface. So looking in the literature, Alberto Hayek's group at UCSD had developed in the 90s um, a very good set of uh, papers where they evaluated the surface, uh, the surface coating of a different variety of, of plates and treatments, and found that this cell line, this HTB9 bladder carcinoma cell line, um, produces an extracellular matrix that is really ideal for human pancreatic islets. So basically we adapted that system to a 96 and 384 well format. And we grow this, these, these are the bladder carcinoma cells. We grow them to confluence and then started by decellularizing with ammonium hydroxide. And what that does is it removes this top layer of cells, but allows the carpet, so to speak, of the, the ECM to remain behind coating the plastic dish. And we can stain that carpet with uh, antibodies for fibronectin and laminin, and even take, uh, a, uh, sorry, electron uh, micro micrograph images of these cells, of the, these, these layers that remain after decellularization. And when we do that and dissociate the human islets, we get a beautiful culture system where we can see, at least by staining, our, our two main cell types, beta cells with insulin and alpha cells with glucagon, that we get a wonderful distribution as expected, about 30 to 50% beta cells and maybe about the same of alpha cells, but there are quite a, a lot of other cell types in the culture. This is actually important to keep, uh, I think, in, uh, in the cells, in the wells for, for screening. But the decellularization process is, is challenging, it's slow, it's kind of tedious. And we wanted to know, can we simplify the process? Thinking that maybe the necessary ingredients of the ECM were secreted right into the media by the bladder carcinoma cell line. So we cultured them uh, for, for several days and collected the supernatant and coated the plates directly with this conditioned media. And we're very happy to see that the, the, in both cases, the cells looked healthy. They were able to be stained with PDX1, which is a transcription factor, which marks the mature beta cell state, as well as with C-peptide, which is another antibody which recognizes part of the insulin, uh, the pro-insulin gene. So it's, it's a marker of beta cells as well. Importantly, we were over uh, also able over Two, one to two weeks in culture, the preserve beta cell function, which is really the, the sine qua non of what a beta cell does. It is a professional insulin secretor in response to glucose. And we could see that even, whether it be the conditioned media itself or after decellularization, we got about a fourfold increase in insulin secretion when we starve cells and then stimulate with, with high glucose conditions. So all in all, we were very satisfied with, with the culture system. And uh, it provides us, like I said, maybe a natural organoid that allows us to probe primary human cells um, with small molecules. So with that, I'm gonna tell you a little story about uh, our efforts to provoke uh, beta cell proliferation and some of the results we've seen there. 
you could think then and much of the diabetes field and the islet field had thought, well, there's multiple strategies for regenerating beta cells. Uh, the pancreatic ducts themselves are, are composed of epithelial cells. And, and for a long time, it's been thought, well, there may be um, a stem cell population residing in these ductal cells. That remains controversial. However, there are uh, chemical perturbations which can induce um, sort of a, a precursor state that allows transdifferentiation into a beta cell-like state. Um, so that, that work is ongoing. Um, Asinar cells, which are important for digestive enzymes in the pancreas, also have been thought to be a source of potential uh, beta cells uh, as well. Here, we decided to go with the route of beta cell proliferation itself. Work by uh, Doug Melton's group at Harvard um, showed in the early 2000s that, at least in the mouse, the beta cell proliferation was the primary source of new beta cells. And so we thought that this was perhaps um, the most feasible strategy or, or maybe the most attainable strategy, at least in the beginning of our, our work. There's a huge problem though. When uh, adults or when, when humans go through uh, adolescence and, and reach maturity, uh, their beta cells stop dividing. And, and this is a, a work that was published in 2008. It's, it's actually a very sad figure where each dot represents um, the islets from a cadaveric donor at a very young age. Um, these are very important for our research, but of course it, it, each one represents probably a tragedy. So it's, it's really quite sad. But the overall conclusion is that while early in life, early after birth, um, beta cells can divide up to, to 3% in cell culture. This drops very rapidly and, and reach, reaches more or less zero by the time of uh, adolescence and, and adulthood. It's another reason we thought that um, it was important to take a phenotypic approach because many of the targets that were going to be important, we, we just, we didn't know where to, to put our chips, so to speak. So we decided to go with a phenotypic approach. And when we culture our islets, these are islets from, mostly we get islets from middle-aged donors. So, so not, uh, not young people, fortunately. But we can culture them for three or six days with EDU, which is a marker that, that's it's a thymidine analog that's incorporated into dividing cells during S phase of the cell cycle. And after three days, we can see, even in the DMSO condition, uh, low but non-zero levels of proliferation in adult cells. So this gave us um, some confidence that perhaps we could actually provoke this uh, or increase, enhance this process with small molecules. And one of the first things we, we found was that uh, this compound, 5-iodotuberosidin, is uh, a, an adenosine analog with an iota group up here. And at 0.5 micromolar treatment over six days, we saw a tremendous increase in the percent of cells that were EDU positive, a percent of beta cells, rather, that are EDU positive. And this is exactly what we're looking for. So you can see on the left, uh, the red cells are our beta cells, and most of these in the DMSO condition do not have EDU. Like I said, it's low but non-zero. Um, in the 5IT condition, however, you can see right away that, that there are so many cells that are going through division, and, and we can really see this in a wide range of, of islet donors, and we've seen this in, in dozens and dozens of donor samples with surprisingly a minimal effect on proliferation of other cell types. Um, and it's become our, our positive control for screening, which I'll get to towards the end of the talk. This is still a very slow process. Uh, when we treat with 5IT for two or three days, we can see some increase, but in terms of, of statistically significant increases, especially what we would expect for screening, six days is really required to provide that best signal to noise and to allow us to reliably claim we have a compound that, that can promote beta cell proliferation. Of course, with phenotypic screening, one of the key challenges is figuring out, well, what's the target? What, how does this compound working? What is the mechanism of action? 
And to our surprise, we found that the 5-IT is a relatively specific kinase inhibitor. Now we, we figured it was going to be a kinase because of its uh, adenosine uh, similarity, but what was surprising was the specificity. It really had no activity on most kinases except for these eight in the CMGC family, which were parts of the DERK and CLK families with IC50s in the, in the double digit in animal or range, which would be very similar to what we would expect for um, our phenotypic screening results. We then tested another DERK1A inhibitor, Harmine, and at the same time, um, one of our colleagues, Andy Stewart at Mount Sinai was, was also hitting upon Harmine. So this, this was really good timing and, and we worked together to try to share compounds and, and share ideas. Um, as, we can, as you can see here, the EDU positive beta cells goes up in a very lovely dose dependent manner with 5-IT treatment. Harmine does exactly the same. It's a little bit less potent, and that re is reflected by its, its slightly less potency to the kinase itself. So this, is, this would make exact sense for us. And then we worked with uh, Rowick Kulkarni's lab at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston to treat animals with 5-IT. And over three weeks, we treated with, with compound, um, followed by the last week with uh, BRD, BRDU rather in um, injection as well. And what we saw was uh, that the number or percent rather of PDX1 KI67 or PDX1 BRDU cells, both markers of proliferation, increased about fourfold over time. Uh, this is in human beta cells themselves because what we do also is to um, transplant human islets into an NSG mouse and then treat the animal in the whole body. We also saw an increase in the endogenous mouse beta cells, but more important to us was, was looking at the human beta cells, of course. Now, that's the target. Let's think a little bit about what the mechanism might be. Um, DERK1A is a kinase that's important for NFAT activity. And by phosphorylating NFAT, it causes it to exit the nucleus and reside in cytoplasm where it cannot activate hypertrophic gene program. Um, this is important uh, because we think the importance of NFAT in beta cell proliferation was already well known. And so this has made a lot of sense and, and a lot of work between uh, Andy Stewart's group and, and others and myself uh, is moving towards defining the precise molecular um, programs that are involved in, in DERK1A activity in the beta cell. As I mentioned, there are a lot of new, new where well, in the last 10 years, many papers have come out that, that reported on new compounds that uh, target DERK1A. These are not all my group. We, we contributed to this, but many others as well. And I think this allows a really strong confidence that we're all triangulating in on um, a similar mechanism that's important to the, to the beta cell. Now you might ask, well, you're promoting proliferation. Do you worry about the other cell types? And then the answer is yes, of course. We don't want to promote uh, global organismal cell proliferation. That would be that would be quite bad for the uh, the animal. And so in that case, what we've done is is taken a, a zinc based strategy. So you see here GNF four eight seven seven. This is a compound from Novartis that uh, targets DERK one A and GSK three beta. And with Amit Chowdhury's lab at the Broad and, and Brigham and Women's Hospital, we, we developed a zinc-based strategy, a zinc prodrug strategy rather. So this is GNF4877 here. And we've also, we've added it to a fluorophore for detection, but then we've also added this, these zinc binding moieties. And zinc is a, a very, very high in the beta cell. And it's a very potent uh, Lewis acid. And so, by zinc-mediated hydrolysis, we can cleave the zinc-binding moiety and reveal just the active ingredient in, uh, in the beta cell only. And so we're working on strategies to really make that uh, as clean as possible in terms of a delivery mechanism to the beta cell. And we've published a number of, of papers um, that kind of lay the bricks down for this strategy. 
Now, as we've been working on DERK 1A, we, we asked ourselves also, are there other mechanisms? Can we take really, a, a, with human islets, it's a daunting task, can we take a larger scale uh, approach to screening? And, and for that, we've been working with the Drug Repurposing Hub, which is available at the Broad Institute, representing uh, several thousand unique compounds that have seen humans, whether it be in approved drugs in the US uh, or, or worldwide actually, or in different phases of development. And so, um, and you can see here the, the, scan, the span of, of what kind of compounds are involved. There are some preclinical as well, which are a little bit more tool compound-like, but it's a great resource for understanding um, mechanism and finding new targets. To do a really large scale screen, we started to think a little bit, and I, I hope that many of you are aware of the Z prime factor for measuring assay readiness and assay uh, reliability. However, we, we, as we thought about it, the Z, fact, Z prime factor really relies on the, the Gaussian distribution of your assay. And in this case, it doesn't apply because of the rare events of beta cell proliferation. So we developed a, a different strategy here where we, we um, calculated a Poisson distribution, uh, Z prime factor, where we're looking at a separation band between, say, a very rare event and then for perhaps your positive controls over here. Um, it provides a little bit more, um, we think, mathematically accurate and precise uh, measurement of the difference between our negative control and positive control then does the standard Z prime factor. And we're working on a, on a manuscript that hopefully will we'll flesh this out in more detail from a mathematics perspective. We were happy to see in 384 well format um, across many plates that our, our negative and positive control wells were quite well separated and looking at DMSO treatment versus 5-IT treatment over six days, the percent of beta cells in each case remains the same. And that's good, that's what we wanted. It was you know, roughly a little bit more than half of the cells in the, the culture were beta cells. The percent of proliferating beta cells was vastly different between the two conditions. Again, that's exactly what we want, where we see that the MSO wells um, are less than 0.5% proliferation, whereas with our 5-IT treatment, we see an increase on, on the order of um, maybe almost 10, 8 to 10 fold in, in proliferation, whether measured by the number of proliferating betas or the percent of proliferating betas. And using our new Z prime based on the Poisson distribution, we get, get excellent values as might be expected here. We also built an online tool, which we call GRAPE, which enables anyone to calculate a Z prime using the Poisson distribution. So if you have a, an assay where you are expecting very rare events to occur and you want to screen, I would, accept, I would uh, suggest you check out our uh, GRAPE online uh, tool or just email me and I can help you uh, access that. So we, just to close, uh, in the last few minutes, we, we finished screening uh, nearly 10,000 compounds, which for, for human islets is, I think, the most ever. So um, we're very proud of that effort, but it did take quite a long time, and it took over 10 islet donors. Um, I'm showing here the repurposing collection, which was about 7,000 of those compounds. This is showing here one of the concerns that everybody's always asked us. Well, don't you see batch to batch variability and, and you're gonna have donor to donor problems? And the answer is yes, of course we were. And that's why on each plate, we include 5IT as a positive control, which serves as a benchmark. And working with uh, Paul Clemens group at the Broad, we developed a, a D score, which is a, a somewhat modified version of a Z score, which allows us to, to score each well relative to the DMSO population. And it really allows us to zero center the data and really see, oh, there are, we do actually have hits and allows us to compare apples to apples, uh, different island donors, which is really apples to oranges. So. We're working right now on classifying some of these hits and identifying new mechanisms as well. Um, so I hope to 
provide an update in coming years. And then finally, I want to close with um, a little bit of a, a message, which is that phenotypic screening, in my mind, is uh, a target discovery engine as much as it is a small molecule discovery engine. We've used many different phenotypes to discover quite a few compounds. Um, compound to target is, as always, the, the longest and hardest step um, of all, but we've really uncovered quite a few uh, proteins a lot of which no one would have predicted have uh, activity in the beta cells or important to any of these, these phenotypes. And I show here some of the methods we use to determine the MOA and, and some of the, the uh, publications that we've um, put in place to, to report these. So again, that's, that's really my take home message is that phenotypic screening is so important for discovering uh, new targets that are important for biology. With that, uh, I wanna thank these are not all members of my group, but uh, many of these are uh, folks are at the Broad or, or former members of the Broad that, that we work together as, as a large team to, to do a lot of this work, as well as the other phenotypes that I didn't get a chance to talk about today. And thank uh, my funding sources and thank you all for your attention. And I hope we have some good questions and good Q&A. Okay, Bridget, thank you. Thank you for a very um, interesting talk and beautiful work. And uh, you pretty much cover every aspect of the beta cells, so which is really <laughs> exciting. Yeah, so, so we'll start from some panel discussion because when we prepare for this digital firm, we really get some questions from the uh, students in the society as they, they really, because we're right, very lucky to invite really pioneers in the stem cell organo and the chemical biology field. So we really would love to, maybe each of you can give us a brief overview. Let's see, what do you think will be the major breakthrough of the field you are working on right now in the next five to 10 years? Hans, do you want to start? Yes, yeah, so, um... The organoids that, that I presented, uh, originally developed by, by Toshi Sato, are made from adult stem cells. And so far, this is almost entirely restricted to epithelial tissues. So um, ectodermal, mesodermal, endodermal, but there's no bone, there's no cartilage, there's no brain. So that's um, uh, a restriction of the technology. Uh, IPS-based organoids tend to be much more complete. And in particular, if you want to grow brain or heart muscle where they're essentially are no adult stem cells. That's the only way to go. Yet also those will, will lack um, additional elements like blood vessels, immune cells, and particularly I think the immune connection as well as the microbiome connection, which is very popular at the moment, could be easily, could be readily studied in organoid systems once they re are developed. So, so the attraction for us was always that organoids are extremely reductionist. So you can ask black and white questions, you get black and white answers but only on simple questions. And of course, the moment you add all sorts of immune cells, it gets much more complex and uh, you'll get many, many data and you'll have to sort, sort them out. But I really think that that'll be the next stage. And if you think about disease modeling, it's particularly the chronic diseases that we don't treat very well at the moment, like the, the chronic autoimmune diseases or, or like, like uh, diabetes that we heard about. Um, those might, and, and are typically very human, very difficult to study in non-human systems. I think this is where organized don't, don't need to be a lot of technical innovation, but I think where they will become very important. Thank you, thank you, Hans. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot of work people done. We already start to see a lot of clinical study people start to do like evalu drug evaluation. And Sean, how do you think? Yeah, certainly, uh, I very much agree with uh, Hans uh, Organoid. Uh, certainly, this uh, will continue to to develop and 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 to really uh, realize uh, its uh, potentials uh, in terms of uh, diagnostics and and also therapeutics. Uh, but also, I hope actually um, my my talk actually also conveyed uh, where actually I I personally felt. Um, where stem cell biology and, and the chemical biology can uh, can intersect uh, to uh, to further develop. Uh, I mean, particularly, I, I think in vivo 
uh, uh, in situ reprogramming, especially uh, with future uh, uh, tissue selective targeting uh, uh, can be actually uh, quite exciting. Uh, that would perhaps allow uh, endogen endogenous cells actually uh, to be targeted, reprogrammed, uh, and, and be, be regenerated. Uh, certainly another area, uh, um, uh, um, in my view, very fundamental in stem cell biology, and also can, can benefit uh, from the chemical biology approach is really this uh, totipotent uh, stem cell induction, where I really see this uh, will fundamentally uh, change actually how sort of a stem cells uh, are manipulated uh, uh, from actually uh, differentiating to uh, from differentiation from differentiating into a specific cell type to uh, to really become uh, manipulating sort of this uh, beginning of life. So, so uh, thank you. And actually, as a follow up about your tissue specific targetation, and in the Q and A session, we saw some attendees ask a question that whether the drug you identify such as two C compound for cardiomyocyte, whether they are specific for this cardiomyocyte. Um, what what what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think very likely, you know, uh, uh, small molecules targeting a specific mechanism. Uh, will be tissue, uh, that type of mechanism will be tissue selective, especially when we think about uh, cell fate modulation. Essentially, those are, you know, developmental pathway or, you know, uh, 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 gene expression transcriptional sort of modulators. Uh, unless the target is expressed tissue, uh, in a tissue specific manner, uh, this type of targeting will not be, uh, if, if sort of the drug actually is orally dosed, uh, uh, the drug actually will not really have a, you know, uh, uh, the tissue selectivity in terms of, you know, that tissue uh, reprogramming or regeneration. I think what we're really hoping to, uh, to further develop is really to, in addition to actually having the drug have the target specificity, we, we would also to, uh, like to install certain features onto the molecule, uh, such as, you know, ADC approach or just a small molecule approach actually to really install a small molecule with uh, tissue specific, uh, uh, you know, targeting uh, features. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. And I know in the chemical biology society, uh, there's a large interest in the ADC drugs and the people working on that. So Bridget, how do you think of a beta cell? You can yeah. make them regenerate everything. So what do you think yeah. it's a breakthrough? Yeah. I think that uh, the next generation or the next direction that really has to, to happen or is, is happening actually is um, tissue tissue crosstalk. So there's been a lot of efforts to, to make um, islet-like structures from stem cells. Um, there's been just a tremendous amount of great work you know, around the globe um, and that's great. On the other hand, there's also a lot of great work uh, developing new microfluidic tools and um, new uh, miniaturization tools to look at different cell types um, using islets. I think combining those to to think about ways of not just making organoids or you know the, the mini islets, but then how do they communicate with the rest of the pancreas, um, with the brain, with the liver, right? Um, so I think that's that's really where a lot of the, the efforts uh, should be going. And then I would also add as a second point is um, this notion of de-differentiation. You know, there's, there's been a lot of um, uncertainty in the islet field, you probably know, is um, I, I presented it as beta cells are lost. Well, what does that really mean? Do they die? Do they de-differentiate? Um, it's not really well understood, at least in the human. And I think that uh, organoids could play a huge role in um, in helping us understand what the, the natural mechanisms are during disease. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, thanks. Can I can I perhaps come in and 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 ask a follow up question to Shaving's one where we've heard some very um, ambitious suggestions. And I guess the next thing to ask about is, okay, well, well what, are the, what are the major challenges? What, what do we need to overcome as a field? And where should we be putting our energy to make sure that we can really realize um, some of these exciting and ambitious goals within, you know, within 
a feasible time frame. Um, and uh, I don't know if Hans, if you'd like to start again, offer your thoughts on that. Where the challenges are in, uh, yeah, uh, well, it's, it's very personal, but so, so I've always had a very strong uh, uh, attraction to, to very, very simple systems where you can actually ask questions and you get, you get it right away, you get a strong answer, or you, or you basically, to be honest, we were always very pragmatic and we just did things. And then when we saw a, something strong happening that was already reproducible and easily measurable, that's what we went after that. And knowing that we had an easy, easy way of measuring effects. And then, of course, when you write your paper, you claim that you're always looking for that the answer to that question. <laughs> and but that, that I can now declare is not always the case. But um, so the moment you come in with multiple elements in a, in a reductionist system, immediately everything dilutes out and everything, the patterns become harder to see. And I think that's where the, the big challenge is going to be. And something like we, are, we work in the gut and the microbiome is, 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 is hugely popular at the moment. And, but it's typically studies from the other end, from you know, the, the whole microbiome in a population of patients with a particular disease. And a lot of it is statistics and uh, uh, associations, but to actually find a way in, in drilling, you know, in a more reductionist way into an extremely complex question, like what is the microbiome now exactly contributing and, and how guilty is it of many diseases? Uh, probably less than we currently uh, see in papers. That would be our greatest challenge. Same thing with the immune system, with all these negative and positive feedback loops. Uh, and the same thing if you'd want to study metabolism in these contexts, where again, you have so many loops that whenever you perturb one thing, you'll perturb 20, 10 at the same time and, and then to determine cause and consequence. So that, that would be the biggest challenge for me. So how can you keep, you know, uh, uh, how can you keep the system such that you can get strong answers mm -hmm. yet study more complex situations? Maybe AI uh, helps there. Very good. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you're going you're gonna to start using sort of more broad global uh, uh, analyses that integrate multiple different components yeah, and perhaps yeah. machine learning or, or something there that would help you to at least make predictions that you could then still test within a more focused uh, type of model might might be in a, an approach. Um, Bridget, I think you perhaps wanted to, to add something in there. I, I was just going to, yeah. Plus one, that comment, <laughs> it was very, it was a very spot on really. It's, it's tough to imagine, you know, already how many different systems are, are, are inter interacting. And so, um, you know, and that's why we would like to work in the island. It's, it's already complex enough <laughs> as it is. Um, Shang, maybe you want to say yeah. something? No, oh, I mean, I, I... Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think maybe I, what I can add is uh, more, uh, you know, for, for the society, uh, I guess actually, you know, uh, the, the chemical biology, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, drug discovery um, um, industry actually uh, are really embracing actually many new opportunities. Uh, I mean, there are certainly always uh, ch challenges, but uh, you know, the artificial intelligence, work noise, you know, CRISPR, those, those are all uh, single cell analysis. Those are just such, you know, wonderful uh, new technologies, uh, new tools actually to facilitate actually uh, better identification and characterization of those uh, different, uh, you know, molecules, small molecules. Um, uh, I, I think that there, there are just uh, more opportunities actually uh, to uh, to to be imaginative to do uh, chemical biology. Uh, can I can I perhaps ask a, a question? Sorry, uh, shaving if it's okay. Is a slightly more focused question to to Bridget and and Sheng in terms of the chemical biology angle. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know your thoughts on you know the therapeutic strategies around small molecules. Do you do you think we're going to be we're developing molecules that we're going to be taking for a lifetime for example so are we are we are we going to be taking having to take these compounds over an extended period or are we looking at things that might we might actually be able to achieve a sort of in situ single come in you know reprogram leave and then have a durable lasting uh response you, 
you know, I don't know if you have any comments in terms of the, the therapeutic consequences of applying those, those molecules. Go ahead, Bridget. Sure. <laughs> um, we are, it, it's a great question, and um, but it's a huge question, right? Uh, of, of thinking about, you know, drug development. Um, I think, and, and lately you've seen a lot of potentially in the press, um, some efforts to work on cell replacements, for example, in type one diabetes with, with the vertex and um, I think uh, others clinical trials um, to use stem cells to generate beta cells for transplant. That's wonderful. Um, in chemical biology, I have to think about it though, as chemical biology, we're trying to answer maybe a different question. That's more of a can we cure? Can we engineer? You know, that's like, um, how do we make the best cells? You know, it's a, almost a different question for us. It's it's very much what are the what are the new targets we're not pursuing that we should be right now from from a lifelong versus you know I think maybe from proliferation you could imagine that if you treat it for a little while and do just enough to to repopulate you could imagine a shorter term. We just have no idea, really, <laughs> from a beta cell perspective. Yeah, Shane, I, do you I, have I, any concur. thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would really concur. I mean, uh, I think conceptually, for for really reparative or regenerative, you you know, that process actually uh, typically would not take very long. So, so I think actually for treating a patient for for only you know a specific period of time. Uh, uh, where actually the, the organ or tissue actually can 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 be repaired or or or, or regenerate actually to you know to full sort of a healthy uh, state then actually uh, perhaps uh, uh, the treatment actually uh, can be sort of stopped. Uh, um, uh, but uh, maybe in some sort of a chronic condition or even in uh, in sort of a, a, um, a, you know preventive uh, type of uh, situation, uh, perhaps actually uh, having, you know, a daily dose uh, of a really, really safe uh, 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 medicine that can really, you know, modulate a specific uh, process uh, can be actually, uh, can be uh, in region. And if I can add for diabetes in, in particular where patients take their medicines every day anyway, uh, it shouldn't be a problem if it's a chronic dosing That's compound, right? right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess the, 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 I suppose the potential risks you might perceive is, is whether with chronic use, you might get more non-specificity, okay. you might impact, um, you know, other, other stem cell populations that, that you might not have with the, with the transient, but I guess we just don't know. And, and, um, well, actually, I mean, I think uh, there is a phenomenon. It's it's called beta cell burnout, where if you okay. treat for over a long time to promote beta cell insulin secretion, you know that that doesn't work forever. And and actually, I think most of these diabetes drugs will see efficacy for some time, and then after some years, they drop off. And that's why there's I mean, part of why there's so many different drugs is because patients often need to be swapped onto different therapies. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this Haiyan uh, Haiyan Fu. Um, thank you very much uh, for presenting your you know state of art technologies that you uh, pioneered. Uh, appreciate this opportunity uh, to uh, share your ideas with our audience. I have a question related to basic as a follow up uh, therapeutics. So how to apply your advances to more complex and challenging diseases? For example, Alzheimer's disease, those are non neurodegenerative diseases. So basically there's no treatment, right? Even, you know, there's a drug approved, but, you know, with unproving uh, evidence of uh, success. So, so well, I will, I'll go ahead, Hans. Okay, no, I was going to ask who was going to, uh, who was going to, <laughs> going to tackle that one. <laughs> to you, so. sure. Go ahead. I mean, I was just going to promote um, phenotypic screening. I think in the case of Alzheimer's in particular, um, 
there's a lot of effort in the amyloid hypothesis that I think we might be best uh, looking for different hypotheses now. And so um, it's really less about finding better drugs that, that hit that part of the biology than we need to think about a whole new, like wipe, wipe the slate clean. That's my opinion. Yeah, and of course there are there are human model systems now that can build the human brain quite well. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course there's, there's quite a few papers claiming that now in these diseases you can study chronic degeneration like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. That, that, that needs to be seen, but, but those would be experimental systems where you could actually, a, a complex, of a complex disease, where you could actually really test your hypothesis because it's, uh, I, I guess you're, you're, you know, you're true, Richard, that Alzheimer's is mostly, uh, it's associated, killed by association in a large part. Of course, there's genetics in the you notice know, of rare cases where the, the, uh, the guilty molecules actually are mutated and, and thereby cause disease. But yeah, there's a huge doubt uh, whether, uh, you know, what the mechanism is for Alzheimer's. Yeah. The same for Parkinson's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's really an excellent question. I guess um, to be uh, provocative, I, I guess the, the regenerative approach uh, or sort of, uh, you know, if, if we think aging is really the biggest underlying, you know, uh, risk factor for, for AD, reverse aging, uh, if there's approach uh, to be developed uh, to reverse aging, those perhaps can be uh, can be in the future effective to treat AD such complex disease. Mm. That might solve a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When you talk about extending life, right? Yeah. So uh, from the human population, humanity. So if uh, we can find a way to even reduce the burden of Alzheimer's disease, uh, they'll extend a lot of people's life. So uh, basically, this question will relate to. How do you use you know organized technology, you know, chemical biology technology, phenotypic screening technology to address those kind of complex disease that mm -hmm. uh, we do not have a solution today? Yeah. Thank you so much for, for your provocative thoughts. I would like to also to follow up first to thank you for outstanding uh, work and sharing uh, with us uh, really very exciting research. Uh, as a scientist who is very much involved in translational research, I was fascinating, uh, Hans, from your studies that you show on the organoids and especially testing and predicting the efficacy of potential uh, therapeutics. I'm very supportive of the idea that just, especially if we are talking for cancer, just doing the sequencing, which now it's a kind of um, a regular thing for all cancer patients uh, that are coming in cancer centers, Sequencing will be always, will continue to be done. But if we don't connect those mutations or amplifications that we are seeing through the sequencing with some functional assay and to really determine what is the driver of the cancer, I think if we combine that, integrate that, those functional assays, then we are gonna have much more successes in the treatment of cancer patients. And I think that using currently, we are all using uh, patient samples from clinic, right? From, but there is some limitations. It's much easier to do with the hematological malignancies versus patients with the solid tumors. So I think that, and this kind of goes to the challenges, challenges that we just discussed. And Hans, during your presentation, you mentioned that. Identifying more simpler ways how we can in the lab, in molecular diagnostics lab, in the clinical lab, how we can actually reproduce these organoids and uh, combine with some functional assays will be really breakthrough in my opinion for precision medicine. Um, so if you want to comment a little bit about that, about that challenge, because- Yeah, yeah Errol. Yeah, so, so if you compare cancer to sort of a bacterial infection, what we've done with bacterial infections for the past 60 years, I mean, to basically grow the bacteria, yeah. give, give a broad spectrum antibiotic to a patient, and meanwhile determine what the bacterium is sensitive to, and then switch to the to bacterium that you know, to an antibiotic that you know works for the patient. And in cancer, of course, we do very sophisticated diagnostics. Actually, DNA sequencing only contributes about, in 10% of the cases, will change the treatment of the patient. 
so although we spend a lot of effort on it, we don't get so much insight. It's still mostly pathology and then staging by scanning, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, so for this, for these organoids to be useful in diagnostics to do something like what you would do for, for bacterial infections, it needs to be much simpler. Now, there's a number actually I'm involved in the company. I, I stepped out because I'm now at Roche, but we actually, or they published a paper in cell stem cell where they describe a microfluidics machine. Actually, we had one or we have one in Utrecht. It works very well, it makes tiny beads of maize gel, and it basically sticks in suspensions of cells taken directly from a primary tumor. And this at low cost in, in a matter of about a week, gives you a readout on, on multiple dozens of drug combinations that you then can, can test directly. So sort of in, the, in between, they grow like organoids, but you, essentially it's an explant that you briefly grow and then screen in these tiny beads. And, and, and this it, it looks like a coffee machine, the thing, and it's easily, it's not very expensive. It's a few hundred dollars a cost uh, to perform this for a patient. So that, that's where, and there's other companies developing similar things, but that's what's really needed if this will ever be you know, finding a place in, in, in a normal diagnostics lab. Yeah. Yeah, that's very exciting. And that actually works for both, right? The solid and hematological malignancies, correct? Yeah. 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 Very exciting. If, if I could add a voice to there, because I, I think it, it really is important that you're considering things like cost and throughput and the, the extent of training, particularly if we, we look at it from the perspective of countries that are less developed, um, where, you know, even DNA sequencing is not necessarily routine, you know, and, and it's it's really the preserve of, of uh you know, specific patients and, and whatnot. And so if you can have a, a predictor that is um, better and more predictive, and if you can cost it to such an extent, um, you know, that it becomes truly accessible, then we really are talking about a revolution in terms of cancer therapy. But I also think, you know, in terms of, of um, diabetes as well, which is again, extremely common in, in parts of Africa as, as an example. I think it would revolutionize almost any area. Absolutely. Fantastic. OK, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, due to the time <laughs> limitation, so I will close the panel discussion. And uh, I want to thank again for all speaker, Hans, Sean, and Bridget. Thank you for sharing your very, very exciting published and unpublished stories. And thank you for Zenita and uh, Haim for joining the panel discussion. And thank you, my co-host, uh, Adrian. And uh, it's really nice to uh, have you join the event. And uh, thank you for attendees and for uh, please pay attention to our future events. The ICBS regional meeting will be hosted in San Francisco in September, and then also ICBS annual meeting, which will be hosted in Australia um, in December. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Keep well.